Greetings and welcome to Beginning and End with Ryan Peterson. I, of course, am your host, Ryan Peterson, author of Judgment of the Nephilim and the forthcoming Final Nephilim. You see the cover behind me, the sequel to Judgment of the Nephilim, and we are continuing our Final Nephilim series. This is part three, The Veil. Why can't we see angels? Why can't we see the angelic realm? We're going to jump into all of that in a moment. Just want to remind you again that Judgment of the Nephilim, for those who don't know, uh, is my first book, a comprehensive biblical study of Genesis 6, the fallen angels, the Nephilim giants, why we had the flood, why God, why did God command wars against the Canaanites, calling for the extermination of whole civilizations, why? It may not be why you think if you're not familiar with the topic. It's because there was a greater war at place, a spiritual war in which fallen angels were trying to undo the prophecy of the Messiah, what I call the ultimate prophecy, Genesis 3.15, when God told the fallen angels, specifically the devil, that his conqueror would be a human child. A child would be born one day, the seed of the woman, the Messiah, who would crush his head redeem humanity, and restore peace and righteousness in this world. This is what set the course of events for the next 6,000 years of human history and many of the things we see in the Bible. When we wonder why did Pharaoh order all the male babies to be cast into the river in the book of Exodus when Moses was a baby and was rescued on an ark, by the way, uh, by his sister, why do we see the numerous attempts to wipe out Israel, even in the days of Christ in his first coming, when he was a baby and Herod called for, again, the babies under two years old to be exterminated? This was all a part of undoing this prophecy, and the Nephilim played a huge role. So let's examine the veil. And what do I mean by that? This was the barrier between the human realm and the spirit realm that we see all throughout the Bible. It's depicted throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament all the way to the book of Revelation. And when we look in the age of antiquity, in the days of Noah, the veil did not exist. There was no barrier between the spirit realm and the human realm. We see many examples of this. So in the antediluvian world, heavenly realm beings openly interacted with humans. In the garden, Eve had an open conversation with the devil when she was tempted to sin. When Adam and Eve and the devil were judged by God, they all stood before God and had open conversation with him. After they were sentenced and banished from the garden, God placed a cherubim, a heavenly realm angel. We're told in the book of Isaiah and many other books that the cherubim sit at the throne of God in heaven. And yet the Lord placed one in the pathway to block the entrance to the garden, as well as a flaming heavenly realm sword. And then, of course, in Genesis 6, we see the sons of God who invaded the human realm and took human women as wives, giving birth to the Nephilim giants and ushering in the flood judgment from the Lord. So there are many examples of this taking place, of no veil and no barrier taking place. And so why does this matter as we look to Revelation? Because, of course, Jesus pointed to the days of Noah and said, if you want to understand the end times, look at the days of Noah. And so a lot of what I explore in the final Nephilim is understanding how God allows prophecies and foreshadows to ripple through time. And this is a very important concept because God exists outside of time. The Lord started the clock in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. That's when God started time for humanity, for our existence. But God is outside of time. An easy example of this is in 2 Peter chapter 3. We were told a day with the Lord is as a thousand years for us. So time is very different for God. In Ecclesiastes verses one, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verses nine and ten, we have a well-known passage that there is nothing new under the sun. But what that passage says is the thing that shall be has already been, and that which is to come has already passed, and there's nothing new under the sun. So again. The Bible is showing us that the events of Revelation have already occurred in some form or fashion. These are types or foreshadows. And we see this all throughout Scripture, even if we don't recognize it. You know, in the Passover, in the book of Exodus, the first Passover, of course, the Israelites were instructed to take the blood of a lamb and place it on the doorstop and the lintels of their doors so the angel would pass over and they'd be saved from the wrath of God. 
when John the Baptist saw Jesus at doing it during his earthly ministry, he said, behold, the lamb of God. So he was saying that he is the true lamb, that all the other lambs that were celebrated at Passover were a foreshadow through time of the redeeming work of Christ. Another phrase that God uses is similitude. And this is found in Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, where the Lord says, I use similitudes. I have multiplied vision. So God is telling us that he will use a similitude. He will allow a picture through human events to ripple through time to inform us about prophecy. And so again, in the final Nephilim, I get a lot into this about time and understanding how time works in the Bible and how prophecies are foreshadowed, not even uh, twice, but sometimes multiple times throughout scripture. And this is how we can properly decipher and decode the many mysteries and the mysterious passage that boggle our minds that we find in Revelation. Another passage that demonstrates this dynamic outside of time, beyond time quality that God has is found in Revelation chapter one. And there Jesus speaking says, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, saith the Lord, which was and is and is to come. So again, Jesus is saying that he's beginning and ending, Alpha and Omega, at the same time. And there are some concepts, believe it or not, in quantum physics that actually seek to explain that very quality of God. And I explain a lot of this in the final Nephilim. So buckle up for that. And so why does this matter? Because again, if we know that God is giving us prophetic previews all throughout the events of scripture, then we can confidently understand Revelation by looking back to the oldest events from antiquity in, of course, the Torah in our Old Testament. And again, we see that Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. And if you want to understand the second coming, then we have to look back to the beginning. Similarly, in the days of Noah, the veil was removed. There was no barrier between the angelic realm. People could see and interact with angels. After the flood, the veil returned. There were only intermittent times when God would present himself to his prophets, like Moses and other prophets, or appear to people, like the people of Israel at certain times in the wilderness. But generally, the veil still existed. Also, an interesting example where God symbolized this was in the instructions for the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 26, God instructed Moses on how to build the tabernacle. And when the for the most holy place, where the Ark of the Covenant was stored and kept, where God's presence manifested once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, God instructed Moses to build a veil and put a veil, a fabric veil, to separate the holy place from the most holy. And only the high priest was permitted to enter. So we see even in the construction of the tabernacle, the veil represents the separation between the human realm and approaching the divine. On that same note, in Exodus 34, Moses spent 40 days up on Mount Sinai with God, learning the Ten Commandments and receiving the law from God. And this amazing passage takes place where we see that when Moses came down from the mountain, it said that he didn't realize that his face shone. He was glowing. And he was glowing so brightly that he frightened his brother Aaron and the Israelites. And so what did he have to do? He had to put on a veil. He had to wear a veil over his face when he spoke to the Israelites because they were so scared. Because by spending that time in directly in God's presence, he started reflecting the divine light. He had pierced through the veil, and now he was physically reflecting that light. In Judgment of the Nephilim, I write about how I believe Adam and Eve also possessed this light. That they, because they were able to walk with God in the garden and speak with God and commune with him and fellowship with the Lord, they also had that light. And this is why when they sinned and evil came upon them and into their bodies and into their soul, they lost it. And that's when they realized they were naked. And that's when they, they never clothed themselves until they had sinned. I believe that light was extinguished. We can look in Acts chapter 7. The apostle Stephen, when he uh, was giving his sermon and the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin were preparing to execute him, heaven opens and he sees Jesus on his throne and then it says his face was like the face of an angel. 
So I believe, again, that light reflected off of him as well. Another example we see of this is during the transfiguration in Matthew 17, when Jesus took a small group of disciples uh, up on a mountain and met with the spirits of Moses and Elijah. And the scripture says that Jesus' face shined as bright as the sun and his raiment, his clothing was bright, emitted bright light. So he was transformed. So in this event, he emitted his divine light. So again, we get these glimpse of, glimpses of the veil being pierced. Another example that really uh, exemplifies and emphasizes how amazing this is and when God permits us to see through this barrier is found in 2 Kings chapter 6, when Elisha, the prophet, is being pursued by the Syrian army and he's with his servant. Now, his servant saw the army surrounding the city, bringing hundreds and hundreds of soldiers and chariots, and he starts panicking and goes to Elisha and says, what are we going to do? And Elisha, calm and confident because he has faith in the Lord, shares a powerful revelation and says, he says a prayer to pray for his servant and praise to God. He says, open his eyes to see. And then God permits his servant to see that they were surrounded by thousands of righteous angels with chariots of fire protecting them. So Elisha, the prophet, could he, he was seeing that all along. God gave him the ability to, to see through the veil. And for a moment, Elisha prayed and God granted his servant that ability to see that they were surrounded by righteous angels and there was nothing to worry about. And of course, they had no issue with that army because Elisha prayed for them to be blinded. So now that we've looked at some examples from scripture in antiquity, Let's shift to end times prophecy. And again, as it was in the days of Noah, the veil will be removed in the end times, in the day of the Lord, the great tribulation. We're going to see the veil removed again. And one of the main places this happens, I gave a preview of it in the prior show, is at the fifth trumpet of Revelation in Revelation chapter 9. This is when the angels who committed the sin in Genesis 6, who committed this fornication and fathered the Nephilim giants and have been imprisoned in the abyss at the fifth trumpet of Revelation chapter 9, they are released. We see a description of a star falling from heaven. This angel, who is the devil, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. This is the moment it happens. He's cast out and cast down and he opens the bottomless pit and these locusts, these beings are released. And these are the Genesis 6 sinning angels. They are described as having the face of a man, the hair of a woman, teeth of a lion, breastplates of iron. They are these hybrid grotesque beings. And I believe that degradation came because they corrupted their body through fornication. Remind you, again, the New Testament says that fornication is the only sin against the body, that you degrade and corrupt your body when you commit it. And so you have these angels now emerging from the abyss to punish the unbelieving world. But also we're told in Revelation 12, at that time, that Michael, the righteous archangel, wages a war. It says there was a war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels. So the remaining fallen angels allied with Satan in heaven fight this war and they are expelled, permanently evicted from heaven. And now they come to earth and they are coming to earth again to carry out God's judgment. And they say in the Revelation 12, the scriptures read, it says that rejoice in heaven, but woe to you inhabitants of the earth for the devil hath come upon you having great wrath for he knoweth his time is short. So just like in the days of Noah, in the days of the flood, you had the, you had the windows of heaven open, bringing these unprecedented rains onto the earth and the fountains of the deep opened, allowing water to come from the earth. So it's a similar flood will take place, except it's an angelic flood. You have fallen angels from the sky and fallen angels coming from the abyss, from the abusos, the bottomless pit. It's a repeat. It's a dynamic repetition, a similitude of the days of Noah. And then Revelation 12 even drives that home further in verses 15 and 17. It says, after the dragon is cast to earth, what does it do? It says, out of its mouth came water as a flood. 
to wipe out the woman who represents Israel and the remnant of her seed, who is the church, it says who carry the testimony of Christ, the believers who are still on earth. So this is showing again through biblical imagery that this is going to be an end times flood. We see another example of this in Daniel chapter 9, in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel, where it's talking about the end times and the abomination of desolation. This is when the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, proclaiming that he is God, when he will demand worship under penalty of death, institute the mark of the beast, and all the things we read about in the book of Revelation. In Daniel 9, 26, it says, at the time... Of this abomination, it says, the end thereof shall be as a flood. So the Bible is telling us that a different kind of flood is going to take place. And this is going to be overwhelming. In the Gospels, the Lord Jesus Christ said that men's hearts shall fail them for fear of what they see coming upon the earth. That literally men are going to have a heart attack and drop dead when they see the fallen angels coming onto earth in person, openly manifesting themselves like they did prior to the flood in the antediluvian era. In the final Nephilim, I go into great detail in this and show that in the oldest writings on Revelation, one of them I quote is called on Christ and Antichrist by Hippolytus, written in the second century. It describes angels singing, presenting themselves as beings of light, deceiving the world, saying that they are benevolent beings here to help humanity, and your true Savior is here, pointing to the Antichrist. But it's a deception. It is the great and strong delusion to lure the world into worshiping the false Messiah. It could also be an explanation for the UFO alien phenomena. We don't know how these beings are going to present themselves, but I get into lots of detail about these things in the final Nephilim. There's also another passage uh, in the book of Isaiah chapter 26. And it's amazing. It talks about, again, this is an end times prophecy. It talks about the return of Christ. And it says that when Jesus returns, he will judge the wicked. He will restore righteousness and order. And it also says that he will remove the cast that covers the world and remove the veil over all of the nations. So part of Jesus's goal and mission at the second coming is to the final removal of the veil. See the stages in which this will happen? We'll have at the start of the Great Tribulation, the veil will be removed and we'll be back in like it was in the antediluvian era when fallen angels could openly manifest. We'll have angels manifesting on earth, carrying out the, these cataclysmic judgments of the seals and the bowls that we read in the book of Revelation and the trumpet judgments. But then, when Christ returns and conquers the Antichrist, the fallen angels, when the devil is sent to the abyss for a thousand years, when order is restored and Jesus rules on the throne of God, there'll be a final veil that's removed, the veil that covers all the nations. This is when Jesus can rule in person. And what we see when we look in the book of Zechariah and see the description of the millennium, it's going to be mortal humans living among Jesus Christ. He will rule from the throne of David in Israel, in Jerusalem. And this is where everything is centered on. That's why you see in the cover of the final Nephilim behind me, I show Jerusalem because this is the ground zero of all of the great tribulation. And this is what the battle is for, ruling on that throne. And when Jesus does that in the millennium, you'll also have glorified, raptured human beings on earth in immortal celestial bodies. So again, and the angels. So again, it'll be this mix like it was in the antediluvian era. It will repeat again. The end is the beginning. The beginning is the end. And God has told us all these things from the onset. This is why it's so important to understand the oldest events of antiquity because it gives us a complete lens and a guide to understand and decipher the mysteries of Revelation. And then of course, as we get to Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we see the true fulfillment in the new heaven and earth, where there's not even a need for the sun and the moon because God's divine light, the same light from Genesis chapter 1 when God said, let there be light on this judged, dark, damaged earth that brought light and regeneration in the new heaven and earth, that light will be all the earth needs. 
and there'll be no need anymore for an altar. Man and God will be united and reconciled fully and eternally and in peace, and the veil will be removed forever. This is God's goal. This is the mission of the Redeemer, of the Messiah. To God is trying to bring his family back together. That is the story of the Bible. It's about a family that was broken, that the Father is now reuniting in love and having to battle and fight a war in order to do it. And how does that war Company? Well, you can find out in the final Nephilim. So um, on that note, thank you so much. That concludes our study part three on the veil. But if you want to learn more about the veil, about the identity of the Antichrist, about how quantum physics relates to Bible prophecy of all things and how there's a convergence between science and prophecy that's taking place right now about DNA and genetics and in the mark of the beast and the genetic component of the mark. And even what early church fathers thought was the meaning of the number 666. Well, you'll find all this and much more in the final Nephilim. I received so many emails asking about when is the next book going to come out? When is there going to be the sequel to Judgment of the Nephilim? It's finally here. It takes time because I put a lot of research and work into it, but it is here and I couldn't be happier with the final product. So I think you're going to really enjoy it. Uh, in addition to the final Nephilim, which will be coming out in September, there will also be companion study guides for both the final Nephilim and Judgment of the Nephilim. Again, my whole goal is to provide what you want and what you ask for. And I get asked all the time about making study guides for these books. Well, now they're here. And on top of that, let's say you have someone who says, you know what, I want to get to know this stuff, but I want to learn about it in a quick way, an easy way, in a night, in one sitting. You can get your popcorn ready because we have two documentary films that are coming out as well. The Judgment of the Nephilim, Secrets of the Pre-Flood World, and the final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth. These are going to be... Uh, very high level overviews of all the key concepts in the book narrated and starring yours truly. They're produced by a Hollywood production company that does works on many films and TV shows. I'm so happy with how it turned out. I think you're going to really enjoy it. And additionally, like I said, it's a great way to get to introduce someone to this topic where they don't have to read an entire book or do an in-depth study, but they can truly learn the concepts in one sitting and get more informed on the Bible. This is about probing these mysteries and growing closer to God. So I couldn't be more excited. Thank you for tuning in and stay tuned. We're just halfway through our final Nephilim series. So stay tuned, subscribe to this YouTube channel, uh, our links to our social media, to the websites, to all the ways to contact me are in this video description. And I look forward to joining you for the next episode. Thank you so much and may God bless you abundantly.